you got to be in service of something. And it's kind of one of these first principles I learned. Being in service of something means I am actually here to help you achieve your goal. And then as a result, I'll achieve mine. If you believe that about me, you will probably accept about what I'm going to tell you in assuming I deliver it with respect. You are actually going to listen and be willing to sort of act on it because you realize it's coming from a place that I want to be in service of you. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Thanks, Susan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a real joy for me to have Ginny Rometty joining me today on the Walker webcast. I I feel like this is a um, one of those uh, classes that somebody who wants to really learn about leadership and as a leader of a company and privileged to run Walker and Dunlop, having read Ginny's book, uh, there is so much for the two of us to get through in this hour. And I'm certain I'm not going to get to all of my material, but I will I will try. And um, as someone who is known for doing my own research on these, uh, on my on my guests, Ginny, I, I do feel knowing how much research you did in your role as CEO of IBM and leading up to that, I felt like I had to do extra homework here to uh, to be prepared to have you on. Let me do a quick bio on you, and then we'll dive into the questions that I've put together. Virginia Marie Ginny Rometty was chairman, president, and CEO of IBM, becoming the company's ninth CEO and first female CEO. Rometty retired from IBM in 2020 after a near 40-year career at Big Blue. She joined IBM as a systems engineer in 1981 and went on to become global head of sales, marketing, and strategy. As general manager of IBM's global services division, Rometty helped negotiate and then integrate IBM's acquisition of PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting business in 2002. During her tenure as CEO, IBM acquired 30 companies for over $8.5 billion and divested around $7 billion of commoditized businesses such as chip manufacturing. Her new book, Good Power, is filled with leadership lessons from Ginny's lifetime of learning, leading, and giving back. She sits on the board of J.P. Morgan Chase, goes to Broadway shows when she can, and likes to scuba dive. So the, the first thing, Ginny, is I feel like I need a title for you because I did an interview of your friend Condoleezza Rice this in July in Sun Valley at our summer conference, and I toggled between Madam Secretary and Dr. Rice. And so I, as I was doing research for you on this, I was sort of like, I need a title for Ginny here so that I'm actually not just calling her Ginny. I'm calling her something similar to one of those titles. No, no, no. It's so funny. You don't, Willie, first, thank you for having me. And please, it's it's Jenny. In fact, I even forever, even when after I become CEO, my email was just Jenny. And, and because it's a little bit of an unusual name and certainly how I spell it, G-I-N-N-I, -N -N -I, it's it's all everyone has ever called me. So uh, that there you go. That's good for us. So pleasure to be here. And uh and to all of your listeners, I cannot believe you have done 160 of these. I mean, that when you yeah. talk about preparation, holy cow. So I owe your Predecessor Sam Palmazano as CEO of IBM, a great thanks for introducing the two of us. Sam's son-in-law, Jack Balaban, works with me at Walker and Dunlop. And when your new book came out, I saw it and I asked Jack whether you could reach out to Sam on my behalf and Sam introduced the two of us. So I'm deeply appreciative of the introduction. And one of the things you talk about in your book extensively is networks and the people who made your career successful. And I'm extremely thankful that I have the relationship with both Jack and Sam to have been introduced to you. So thanks to the two of them. Your book, as I mentioned, is filled with all of these incredible, what I call life lessons, leadership lessons. Uh, I'm going to run through a couple here and we're going to dive into a number of these during it. But, you know, being in service of others, getting to the aha moment with clients. Arnie Sorensen at Marriott once saying to you, be the best IBM you can be. Your husband, Mark, turning to you after he had built a golf a putting a putting range or a putting green in your basement, and you kind of pushing back on why Mark went and did that. And he looked at you and he said, Ginny, you've got to be present to vote. In other words, if you're going to be in New York working, I get to do whatever I want in this home. Make the complex simple and the simple scalable. I stopped on that one, Ginny, for about 10 minutes and ran it through in my mind. Make the complex simple and the simple scalable. And then the final one is a public company and something that you and I both have both the pleasure and the burden at times of, of going to investors and analysts and talking to them about what we're up to and running publicly traded companies. 
the comment you said where once investors said to you, always run the company for the long-term owner and not the short-term renter. And uh, you and I both have met with plenty of hedge funds that were invested in IBM or Walker and Dunlop for as a renter and not a, a, a long-term owner. But one of the other things that you say in the book that I kind of went back to throughout reading it was that people don't necessarily remember what you say or how you say it, but how you made them feel. And it made me think back on all the Walker webcasts I've done and the fact that I try and bring information and questions that get really good information out to the people who listen to the Walker webcast. But I've never thought about it in the sense of how should people feel when they get done with listening to this hour? And so my question to you, given we're going to talk about your book and your career, how should people feel after they listen to our discussion? Well, first, I mean, Willie, you obviously did your homework. So I am really... Uh very humbled by that, that you would take all that time. And the points that you remembered make me feel good and how I would like anyone listening, because an hour of time is a lot of time, you know, back to one of those lessons. If people give you their time, you got to give them something in return. So I would hope people feel inspired to keep working on something hard, even though it's really hard and that, you know, that they can do it. If after they've listened to this, that they're like, yeah, you know, I can about do anything I want to do and, and get it done, that they have the power to do it. And I will put a footnote. I hope that they feel, because uh, really one of the biggest things I wanted to get across in the book was that how you do what you do may be just as important as what you do. And I think that's something pretty much lost in the world of leadership right now. Well, that touches on a point that you make throughout the book, which is that nobody can define who you are. You need to define who you are and live to who you are. I think a lot of that sort of comes out of the traumatic experience that you identify in the book of your father leaving your family when you're 16 years old. Talk for a moment about that trauma and then how you and your siblings and your mom kind of worked through that and worked out of that. But more of it is the enduring qualities that it gave to you from a leadership and from a personal sort of, I guess, ethos of the way that you've yeah. lived life. Yeah. It, look, it was hard to write a book and talk personal. And so you've done a lot of these interviews and you, you probably see a range of people who want to talk about personal things or don't. And I probably spent a lifetime not talking about them. But the book starts on a point, which is not to make anyone feel sorry for me and not that I'm a victim. Quite the contrary. I, I start the book talking about, I happened to witness, and my father did not know I was standing there. And I witnessed everything he said to my mother. And that day, which is a culmination of obviously years of things that had happened, he stood there in the garage and said to my mom, I really don't care what happens to you. I don't care what happens to any of you. I had three siblings. Uh, he told my mother she could work in the street for all he cared. And that would be the last I would see. And he would turn and leave. And this is not about like sort of victim or making a, my father a horrible person. I really start there to celebrate my mom, to your point. So what did I learn? Because... What my mother had to do, she was 34. She has no money, no home. She's got four little children. She has not had an education past high school uh, and no job. And so she had to find a way. We had to go on food stamps, welfare. We we're going to lose our house. She had to find a keep us in school even. And so, you know, got a little bit of education, got a little hourly job at night, a little more, a little better job, finally a job in the daytime, et cetera. And sort of fast forward all of that, I think something for people, something that is at the root of me and for people to take away is that only you get to define who you are. Like my dad, she wasn't going to let him define her as a loser, as a divorcee, not that that was bad in that day though, right? This is, this is now in the seventies. He wasn't going to, she wasn't going to let him define her as all these negative things. And it really, my mom never said it, but each one, and, and I always say like, I'm the underachiever of the group. My other three brothers and sisters are very successful. Like my mother will go, I really don't know how this happened. And it is really her because we just, she never said it. We just witnessed this idea that, hey, 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 don't let someone define you. You define yourself. And one other, if I can, just a real quick point of that, the other big learning, which will then, it's funny now that I'm old and I look back all this fits in place would really be a silver thread in my life. What I would take away from watching my mom was that access and aptitude are two different things. My mom was, was bright. It wasn't that she didn't have, you know, some sense, but she had no access to anything. And it made me see, you know, God kind of spreads talent evenly around the world access, not so much. 
And this will be a thread that leads to what I do today. It led to how I worked, how I how I led, the things I did with talent and people that be careful, access and aptitude are not equal. A lot of people with aptitude, but not necessarily the access to education and other things. So in that two year period from 16, when your dad left to 18, when you went to Northwestern, you basically took care of your siblings and you talk in the book yeah. extensively about the fact that your siblings were sort of your, your, your kids to some degree, but what's the, what's the good and the bad of Ginny Rometty that came out of that period of time? There's clearly a strong fire that came from you of being independent, of wanting financial security, of having this kind of tenacious spirit to work really hard to be independent. What's the other side of all that? You mentioned briefly in the book about trust in people and when people break Ginny Remedies. Trust yeah. probably not a great. Well, you answered your you you answered your own question, right? Because I, I do say that. <laughs> well, I, I, I took what you wrote in the book. I want to go a step further and say, is there anything else in there? Yeah, I I, I do. I think out of that time, and, and it is true because decades would go by, and we can, if we have time, talk about that about being a a woman in a very senior leadership position. And there's much discussion: Can you have children? Should you have children? Can you have children? Can you take care of them? What you know, people dual careers, etc. And I actually end up spending some time in the book talking about that because it's a, a topic people always ask about. And, and they actually make some wrong conclusions about, well, gee, the only reason Mark and I've been married 45 years almost don't have children are because that's what she had to sacrifice to be able to do what she did. And the truth of the matter is it was a conscious decision that we didn't, because I know plenty of women in my spot, men, great men too, that all have happy families and children or have raised them themselves. And so I don't feel this is a binary decision, but in that time, what I did feel, my mother always says, I know one of the reasons you don't have children are you've raised yours already. You feel like you've raised your children. So I don't feel it's a bad thing that came out of it. I feel it is a feeling that I did have, but what also came out of it, and I, and it, can drive people crazy. I mean, A, that hard work can be a plus and it can be a minus, right? You're very driven. And so, and that's only because you've been driven to have to take care of yourself and realize that you always have to be independent. So that has both a silver lining and an underbelly to it, that idea. And your comment about loyalty. To me, I have great empathy for people, but but once someone, it's really hard for me once they've broken that trust to earn it back. And, and that's probably a manifestation of that time, Even, but I'm very aware of it. So it has to be a big thing now. I have to be careful, not little things, big things that I, I thought I'd bring that in. So you talk about access and access to opportunity, access to education. You were a great student. You didn't do a whole, I mean, your homework, as you said, was your hobby. Yeah. Um, you got into Northwestern and you went to Northwestern on a 75% scholarship and you had to work really hard to find the other 25%. And you talk in quite detail about how you went around. I mean, you almost did bake sales to send Ginny to Northwestern to try and pay you that extra 25%. And my question was, what was it that, I mean, you were the first to go to college out of your, out of, I believe, I mean, maybe you were the second in your broader family, but you were the first out of uh, clearly your siblings and, and your parents. What was it that made you strive to go to Northwestern rather than, if you will, and I'm not trying to just go to the University of Illinois, that wouldn't have been the financial burden that it was. What was it that said to you, I really need to strive to go to Northwestern? Yeah. So this is interesting. And, and again, I think about when I do these podcasts, like, what can I say that's going to help? Not just people, oh, isn't she, that's it's an interesting story, but like, can they take away from it? And at the time, very different than today. I applied to two schools, University of Illinois and Northwestern. I couldn't afford to apply to anymore. And I was I sort of new, okay, I think I can get into a state school, University of Illinois, and then I'll do this stretch school. But to me, the lesson to learn on that and why only two, Northwestern admitted people on, on in, it was purely on your academics. And then they provided needs-based financing, need-based tuition assistance. And so that is to me a really important point in today's world where all the debate is about affirmative action or the Supreme Court ruling and what do people make? Does that sort of strike all this down? You know, I come from a time when that was a time when there were not women in underrepresented minorities in many positions or schools and schools did something to try to level a playing field because that's what I think of as affirmative action is trying to say you and I don't have exactly the same starting point and can I at least do something to give us the same starting point and then we go from there 
And it's to this day, I'm vice chair at Northwestern now, still based on if you can get in on your credentials, we will help you find a way. So for me, part of that was scholarships, loans, et cetera, that you just say. But the bigger takeaway was I knew it was a better school. And I knew that if I could, well, no offense to anybody who's went to University of Illinois, I'm very, you know, it has done very well over the decades too. But I knew that if I could could get in, that we, between me and they, we would find a way to be able to, to afford to be able to be there. But I think the broader point is around, you know, what that does as all of people listening, you running businesses, you know, to not give up on things about giving people a fair starting point, because, you know, Another thing I learned is where you start, like my case, shouldn't determine where you end, right? And so what can we do to compensate different starting points? So you were you were literally quarter poor yeah. at Northwestern. I, 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 as I was putting together the script, I said, you know, that's kind of a cool term. She was quarter poor. You were. You were down to your last quarter. And you I talked was. in the book about the fact that you had one quarter left. And all yeah. of a sudden, someone mentioned you to apply for a GM scholarship, and you got that GM scholarship, which obviously changed the next two years of your life at Northwestern as it relates to having a GM scholarship, having summer internships at GM. And back to your loyalty point, Ginny, when you had offers to go work for Hewlett Packard and a bunch of West Coast technology firms, which is as an engineer where you wanted to go, you decided to go to GM out of that loyalty for them giving you that scholarship. Yeah. And and I think this is actually an important point still. It's not blind loyalty, right? I do think people, they had obviously paid my tuition then for two years and salaried me in a job and gave me a job with tenure, no strings attached. Now you see very little scholarships like that today from anyone, but in that day, it's what they did. I mean, talk about sort of a guardian angel idea that, and it was a professor who said to me, look, I know this is, you've got a lot of loans, you have this aid, here, go, go. They're going to pick one kid from each school, go interview for this. But it taught me, obviously there is a bit about loyalty. I feel when someone invests a lot in you, you want to do something in return for them. And they did. I at least owed them a chance. But I think the more valuable lesson I then got when I went to work for GM, which I think, I think about anybody listening at different points in their career. I said, I was lucky at an early age. I really saw the difference between a job and a career. And that, you know, a job people go to, and there were a lot of people around me that loved cars and that's fine. They went, I wasn't passionate about cars. I liked them, but I was actually, I was working on trucks and buses too. So it was even one removed from a car. And I learned I had a computer science degree and my husband's like, okay, well, if you're not at lot, like he's the one that said to me, why not IBM? I mean, why don't you go apply what you love? you know, to industry, lots of industries and do this problem solving. And I felt like at a really early age, I realized that, that it was a job to me. It wasn't a career. And the difference is the passion you feel about something you do. I I mean, like it's, it's, you know, it's naive to think you're going to be passionate every minute of the day. There, all of us have to do things we don't like to do at the same time in our jobs, but in the realm of what your firm does, you got to feel some passion around it. When you went to IBM, you started one of your first, <laughs> you really got to know laser printers really, really well. Yeah, 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 yeah. The book about laser one of many, printers. yes. I, I, if we still had laser printers around, I'd be like, and now I know who can fix my laser printer. I, was, I could, I could, yes. Book. But when you were asked to jump into the services business, IBM wasn't in the services business. And they asked you to take a new role in creating a services business, a consulting business inside of IBM. And that was a pretty risky move. And, and you talk in quite some detail about the conversations you have with Mark about whether you ought to take the risk inherent of moving into that type of a role, which given your background and given having the career path that you had at IBM, it surprised me, to be honest, that you would take the risk of moving into that less defined role rather than staying on, if you will, the more traditional corporate path. What what was it that gave you the, if you will, the chutzpah, the ability to jump into that new realm? It's a good segue and probably into something else you would like to ask me, but they're really connected, just a little disjointed in time, is there are a lot of people I know like me. So every time you see something new to do, I can think of 10 reasons why I can't do it, not the three reasons why I can do it. And so, it, and as you just said, I'd always been on a pretty tried and true career path. And so when this new thing came out, it was full of unknowns, meaning if it didn't work out, that old path wasn't going to still be there, really. And I hemmed and hawed over moving into something new. And 
it, it was really, again, one of these cases, my husband talking to me, but this would carry on through not just this job. It would carry on in other, other ways as I would go on in my career. Every time it was a new job, it would be, oh, I don't think I can do it yet. I need more preparation. I need more skill. And it would be through one of these conversations with my husband, Mark, that it would be probably one of the most profound learnings I would have in my life in what I share with people. It was a couple jobs after that one, Willie, and I was interview. I was working for someone and he said, hey, I'm getting promoted and I think you should take my job. And I said, oh, I am not ready for your job. I can do about a third of it. It's very large and IBM. It's global. I don't know these three pieces, et cetera. And he said, well, go to the interview, Jenny. And I went to the interview. I got offered the job and my reaction was not what most people would think. My reaction was, I'd like to go home and talk to my husband. And I can still see the gentleman's face looking at me saying, okay. I call Mark and he says to me, he listens to me like, oh yeah, I'm blah, 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 blah. And he says, Jenny, Jenny, I've, he says, I have one question. Do you think a man would have answered the question that way if offered the job? I said, no. Now I tell that story, not because it was a gender story, really. What Mark was saying to me was, I've seen this movie many times now with you and you're very nervous, but then in six months, you're going to have it done, knocked down, ready to go to the next thing. He's like, why do you do this over and over? And it crystallized, it's almost an alternate name of the book, which was growth and comfort will never coexist. Right. And it would be the beginning of me really, this is uh, to me, Willie, the reason I even tell any of these stories in the first part of the book, it's that essence that for all of us to grow, you got to start to equate risk with growth, not risk with downside. Like, you know, why would you do something? And it would grow over time to me. I would begin to do very risky things. And I would, over time, because I would start to associate anything I felt uncomfortable with, with knowing I was learning something. And that's a very freeing feeling when you're like, no, no, I got to do something I don't know. Because God, I'm going to actually, on the other side, painful in the middle, but the other side, I'm going to come out with like some other skill I don't have today. That's really good. And so that idea of growth and comfort never coexist. I would find it to be tr true for a person. I would find it to be true for IBM, a company. I would find it to be true for a country. And it's kind of at my heart of how, of who I am. And there's a conversation, even my, my sister I was talking to this weekend. And she said, uh, my brother said to her, do you not remember what your sister always says? Growth and comfort never coexist. You know, it's, it's one of those. And so to me, if people probably forget anything else of our webcast, maybe that will help them reframe risk and reframe how they look at taking some chances. Well, the, the, and the punchline to the story you just told is after Mark said- Oh, I took the job, yeah. <laughs> like, not only the punchline is you took the job, but you went back in the next day to the gentleman who offered you the job and he looked at you and said, never do that again. In other words, yes. like you went back in, he's like, "What? It, it, you looked a gift to us in the mouth for the last 24 hours. Like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, why yeah. didn't you just I, say yes? And, and, and he was, and he was doing that to he help said, me. Don't do that again. Yeah, he was doing that to help me. He said, yeah. don't ever do it again. And I said, I understood. I understood exactly what he meant. And in, in not, I'm not going to necessarily say gender, but this, cause this resonates with men and women, but there are so many women around the world. I know that have the same, and there are a lot of studies that say women will tell you the five things they can't do. Uh, men will tell you five, they can just, and this is an issue that is it, like, once you're cognizant of it, I would see it over and over again in hiring men and women for jobs. I would see the discussions would be about what a woman hasn't done yet, yet the experience the man hasn't done it yet either. I mean, so I would see this kind of unconsciousness come through in so many different ways in the years to come. I, I had Julia Borston from CNBC oh, yeah. on the webcast, I don't know, six months ago, and she has a book, When Women Lead. And one of the one of the most impactful kind of data points out of that book that I read was that men are far more successful in getting series A venture funding than women, because not that men will BS, but men tend to look at the future and dream about the future, whereas women are much more practical about what their existing skills are. So when they go to pitch a business to a VC firm, they women will tell the VC firm, this is what we do today. And a man will show up and he'll say, no, but this is what we're going to do tomorrow. And series A funding goes to the vision for tomorrow, not the here and the now. And then when you get into later rounds of venture funding, women are equally as capable at raising series B, C, D, and E, because it's actually on the performance of the company, not necessarily on the vision. And I thought that back to your point about women and men in interviews, that's, that, that, that is a really important point to keep in mind. 
Yeah, this is it is so interesting. I, I would have to say to the team all the time, why do we talk about a woman? The questions are on experience and the man is on his potential, right? Which is exactly the story you just said. And it's also good learning to take away that you just have to be conscious of it, right? Right. So the day you were named CEO of IBM, Sam had told you a couple of days before there was some media work to do on the press release and you couldn't tell anyone but Mark. And then the day that it comes out, you sit there, you watch CNBC, you see where all the analysts are saying, you know, this is going to be her tenure. What can we expect from her, et cetera, et cetera. And then you went back to your office and you picked up the phone and you called the 20 people who had made you getting to that job possible, which I find to be an incredible it's just an incredible anecdote about you and what makes you what you are, but then also stopping and thanking all of those 20 people. One of those people that you called, Ginny, was Pat O'Brien. Mm. And Pat O'Brien was one of your early manager leaders at IBM who you worked with. And in the book, you tell an anecdote about a discussion you had with Pat about appearance. And my, if you would, just if you could give a synopsis of that discussion as it relates to appearance. And the real question I have for you is this. You mentioned in the book that this anecdote or this conversation really can't happen in corporate America today. It could happen back in the 1980s when you and Pat had the conversation. It can't really happen today. And my question to you is, is that a good thing? Or do we miss the candor and the coaching that Pat showed to you because we have to be, if you will, more politically correct about what we talk about in in in, in corporate world? Yeah. Well, look, I'll tell the story. And, and the answer, of course, is going to be a little bit of both of what you just asked me, Willie. Um, not as a cop-out, but a little bit of both. So the uh, conversation Willie's referring to uh, and why I chose to share it was um, Pat talked to me about my weight. And for most of my life, I have struggled with my weight up and down, up and down. And um, I come from a good hearty family that associates food with comfort and easing things. And so I've got good, good genes on all of this. And, uh, and so at one time I was, I was probably a good, oh my goodness gracious, maybe 75 pounds more than I am now. And uh, he said to me, Jenny, I, I just want you to look around and look at all these other people uh, running these companies. They don't look like that. And he said, I just really am afraid for you that that's going to be a problem, right? And 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 he was very nervous about this conversation, right? And at first I'm like, are you, are, what are you trying to say? Because he's like, look at the differences. I'm like, are you talking about my weight? Are you talking about, what are you trying to say? And he said, look, I he really was trying to say to me, I can't help what other people think. And I'm just telling you, I hate to see something in your way. So many people, it's funny, Willie, you bring it up because when I've done media interviews, it's the story of many, well, of a, the few handful that people always go to, it is one of the stories. And they really want to make it a bad thing about Pat. And I say, wait, before mm -hmm. you, you conclude a bad thing about this man, he was my greatest supporter. I said, everything has a context. And in this world, you want to turn everything into a soundbite that has no context around it. And that context was a man who'd already taught me how to lead with great values. It's the same man who, when I had someone working for me, telling very off color jokes, but the top performer uh, and people were starting to kind of complain about it. Pat said to me, oh, well, this is clear what you should do. I'm an, a new manager. He says, this is clear. He said, you tell him one time, it stops immediately or you fire him. I don't care how good he is. And it, it was those kinds of things he taught me, which was how to lead with values in the big arc of, and, and these would be to me the most valuable lessons I would learn about if really hard decisions are made based on values, they become really easy. And so that same person is who said that to me, right? And so I knew he meant it out of goodness and he did it the best way. I talk about having like a velvet hammer on things. He did it his best way, as awkward as that was for him to do. Um, he was trying to be helpful to me. Now, so that's why I say, is it good or bad in today's world? People would shudder to talk about that today. And it's a shame because he didn't believe it, but he's saying, I can't help what I see out there. And it is what people, you know, I can't take responsibility for how they're going to act, but it's, I see this. Now, I would eventually work on this issue. I didn't at first. I don't remember doing another thing about it after that. I knew he meant well, so be it. Um, those of us that struggle with weight know it's a very hard thing to deal with. And I would eventually do it for my health as time went on. But, it, you know, that's another whole podcast on that topic. But uh, I think good or bad today, I think it's a shame that you don't get some really valuable coaching because people are afraid. But you can only give it when there's been a safety sort of circle built around it for someone to talk to you like that. 
You mentioned Velvet Hammer. Um, yeah. How can someone create a Velvet Hammer? It's a yeah. it's a it's a real skill. It's it, it's it's being able to give hard information, but in a in a coaching consultative way. It's it's being able to take hard decisions and not be sort of thrown out to the dogs after making the hard decision. How, as as you think about your skill of having a velvet hammer, what are the what are the key attributes to being successful at having a velvet hammer? Yeah. So if I can, um, I wanted to to go back a, a second on something because when I wrote this book, um, of course, no one will need, they won't need to buy it really after talking to us because you'll, you, we've, we are going to cover everything. But this, <laughs> no, they, they definitely should buy it. It's no, really, no, no, I'm teasing. Don't it's worry. It's really about good. That. that isn't my purpose of this at all is it was called, it's called good power. Right. So like, why is there, you know, I'm, I'm just going to actually, after you talk to a fella today from Harvard, that these studies that say 90% of people who get power do something bad with it, meaning they become more aggressive. They become, um, they may lie. They're they're um, combative, defensive. 90% of people that get power. And in my view, we all have power. My mom had power when she had nothing else. Um, that it's about convincing you that you have power, like sort of as an individual, which is why I, I kind of talk about the power of me, we, other people, us, kind of society, these three realms, it grows over time. And it can be done with, respect, which is going to get to this point that you're asking me about a velvet hammer. It can be done with respect. It can unite people. And it can be about making progress, not perfection. And so uh, this idea of a velvet hammer came when a client actually said it to me and it crystallized something I did. And it's the idea that can you give people bad news, but in a way that they can actually not just hear it, but they'll want to take action on it. And so you say, well, what do you have to do in order to be able to do it? I think there's like something I came to learn that it's a fundamental first step before you can do it. Um, and I think this is important for your firm, your clients. You got to be in service of something. And it's kind of one of these first principles I learned. Being in service of something means I am actually here to help you achieve your goal. And then as a result, I'll achieve mine. If you believe that about me, you will listen to what you will probably accept about what I'm going to tell you in assuming I deliver it with respect. You're going to, you are actually going to listen and be willing to sort of act on it because you realize it's coming from a place that I want to be in service of you. And so um, I talk about this a lot in the book and how I learned it. And I must say people have a hard time understanding that. Do I, do I just serve my customers or be in service of my customers? And you know, I, I just recently had my knee replaced it, and I talked to different surgeons. One surgeon, you know, hey, I get these done. My surgery looks perfect. The fact that you still can't walk well, that's not my problem. I, the surgery looks good. Okay. I would say he served me. I had the real surgeon that did my job. My knee puffed up and all this stuff. He's like, oh no, this is not, you know, he wasn't done till I was able to do everything I could do before surgery, right? He isn't done he is in service of me or the waiter who just drops your food off, that's serving you. But the guy who cares, you actually had a nice evening, whatever that meant. You can tell the difference. And they do it like a waiter is doing it because he's hopeful you'll get a tip, but it's not transactional. He doesn't know for sure he'll get one. So he did it first, knowing in return, he might get something. And so to deliver bad news in a respectful way and have it actually be actioned on, I think comes from having that idea of that you've been in service of the, this person or this thing. They know that. They understand that you work on their behalf, hoping eventually it's your benefit, but it's not transactional in the moment. And so, and then it came from just delivering bad news with empathy, with respect, basics that you know, which are, there's good things here too, right? And then here are very... Um, in a very, uh, what would be the right word, uh, non-combative way, you know, the couple things that would make it better. And so the client, well, I had to deliver this message. It was a horrible message, by the way, I had to deliver about work they'd done and all of it being a waste and why. And when I was done, and it was very critical of him, but he came up to me and said, you know, I thought he was going to really be upset. It was the CEO of this company. And he said, no, no, you have a velvet hammer. You, you told me that in a way that made me want to act on it. And so I would always remember that in, in how I delivered bad news to people. And, and the root of it is being in service of and having empathy with what you're about to do. So 
Another characteristic that you have from your leadership was a doing more homework than anybody else. So you knew all the issues that were on the table as it relates to both the good and the bad feedback you were giving them, some great idea that IBM had come up with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you were always prepared, but you also did a lot of research on what you call tidbits, um, sort of outside the, the mandate research that made you know your clients potentially pieces of either their background, their work, their family life, whatever, that added an, an additional context to it. Give, give an example of one of those tidbits and why that was so effective as it relates to your leadership of the consulting practice at IBM and how it, it, it made you so effective as not only a leader, but quite honestly, I would assume that was super uh, effective on the sales side of winning engagements. Yeah. So if I may just, again, back to people who are listening, you know, running businesses or they're running their career and what they're doing. I tried to give some practical advice on this topic. And, and I should say the whole book is revisionist history, right? So this is now that I'm old and I can look back. Okay. So like there was no divine brilliance I had at all. And it, I give credit to lots of people that I learned these things from, right? So this is just being willing to be a learner. And um, that idea of how to be in service of and to do something good for your client, it, it's come from those very early days, A, be in service of someone, right? So be really clear in your mind that what you said when we started, if you give me this hour, I better give you something in return, okay? So this would be very deep in my head. And what are ways to give you something in return? So I don't believe having a meeting with someone, if they've given you their time is, on one hand, you could just go and listen the whole time and let them talk. Well, that, okay, that's better than you talking the whole time. That's good. The other is you listen to them and try to say, how can I extend what they know, right? And apply, give them something else to solve their issue or whatever it is that they could either draw a comparison to or may not be aware of, or as a new idea, an aha for them. And so to prepare for that, I would have to really, it, it would be the kind of thing you should do. I think any of us do professionally is just this constant curiosity. And so, you know, you, you know, your clients, you know, what's coming up. Things I read, I'm like, that's an interesting idea for somebody, right? Jot that down for or this client A, client B are like, yeah, you know what? I can see how those three examples I've seen at one great client do could apply into another place. And it gets down to the root of, are you a, are you constantly both listening and wanting to learn and asking questions? I know that is so basic, but people do not listen with an intent to learn very often. They listen with an intent to make their point. And mm -hmm. that is so different than if you listen with an intent to learn. And if you do that, you'll collect all these tidbits. Now, for me, I had to write them down a lot to prepare just because I forget them. It's my way of remembering things. Um, but it gets back to this idea of the biggest way you build a network. You mentioned this when we started is by what you give, not what you get. And if you can really get that in your practice about you give me me time, I get to give you something valuable. I've got to help you with things you might not already know. I've got to give you insights or ways to think about things uh, that aha. Um, it all gets back to this. I respect your time. And that preparation, I mean, you're right. I do write about it. It becomes a little bit legendary. It can drive people a little bit crazy as time would go on. You know, I mean, I, I could be excessive about this. I have to watch it, all that kind of stuff. But in the end, I, I was smarter and better for it and I could help people more for it. Right. And I think you're a service business and in service isn't transactional. It shouldn't be in my mind. Right. It, it is about what do they need? If I help them do that, they're going to be your client for life. It may not be in this moment, but that does come around. And the same is true with relationships. Right. I called those 20 people, you know, through time I'd given a lot to them, but I got a lot in return. Right. And so that, People, I think, have a way misunderstood view of networks, as an example. They think networks are, you're a networker, you just know people. I think networks come from what you give to people, and over time, it comes back to you. And it really, as time goes on, those people offer you perspective that you sometimes can't see. Yeah. So I branched off on a few things. I know, and the only other thing that I'll that I'll point out that I think is another piece to your personality and your leadership style was writing handwritten notes. And um, in a in an age where it's all too easy to zap someone a text and say, "Hey, thanks for the meeting," or send them an email that may have been AI generated for all we know. The idea of sitting down with a piece of paper and a pen and actually writing someone a handwritten note that clearly was a marquee of your leadership style. Yeah. You, you know what? It's, it may sound kooky. 
I don't know. Do you get handwritten notes? Do you remember them more than the other ones, Willie? I'm curious. Of course. Of course. You do. And I actually, I went to a wedding, just as an aside, I went to a wedding two weeks ago and I've written a thank you note to the people who invited me to the wedding. They wrote me a thank you note for showing up at the wedding, which I thought I've never gotten a thank you note for going to a wedding. And I got home from vacation. I was like, wow, that's quite something. Um, but yeah, well, it makes a big difference. And, and so I'm not, it's not like I'm on, on a um, crusade about handwritten notes. The point to me was it's a sign of respect to someone because you've obviously taken more time to do that and you've personalized it. And when it gets to change management, I think one of the greatest ways to get people to do things they don't want to do is to personalize it for them. And yeah. so it, it's all really in that big point to why I've bothered in, uh, in, in to do those personal notes. Because, you know, it drives me, I'm LinkedIn. If you ever get these messages and LinkedIn tells you what to respond back, it'll it'll generate it for you. And I almost feel like, oh, that is like so lazy of me. I can't, if I hit that button, that person's going to know it's like a machine, you know, like, hey, right. thanks for, you know, it just, and I really worry about that, right? So about in the big arc, what that means here. So let's take that as a segue into AI, because that's yeah. a, that's kind of a perfect segue into AI, because you talk a lot in the book, Ginny, about trust and how the whole prism uh, issue and 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 the work that you did and had the general counsel at IBM write the letter, which to this day is one of the most straightforward, transparent statements by a U.S. technology company or a global technology company, as it relates to what you will and won't do, as it relates to people's data, as it relates to requests by the federal government for access to, the, to that data and what IBM would do in response to a federal government inquiry for per, people's individual data. Um, but I think AI scares a lot of people today. It, 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 the implications of it are both exciting from an R&D standpoint. Um, I at our summer conference talked extensively about the work that DeepMind has been doing on Alpha, Alpha Go, Alpha Fold, and Alpha Zero, and and what that's done on the Alpha Fold to allow us to get um, incredible insight into proteins. Uh, that has been released to all medical research facilities as well as drug manufacturers. And now that we have the sequencing of all the proteins out there, just how that will accelerate the medical research and the development of drugs and things of that nature, that's an incredibly huge benefit to humanity and to us and to our life and potentially for how long you and I live. On the flip side of it all, there, to your point of 90% of people who get power abuse that power in some way, we all feel that AI might get some power over us that's unleashed and we'll never be able to reel it back in. As having been there right at the beginning when you you know, yeah, put Watson. Watson to it and had the Jeopardy game and watched Watson beat the two best Jeopardy players. I also thought it was amazing that you actually brought in Alex Trebek to do that trial. I thought that was, I thought that was amazing. I was like sitting there saying, lead it to a big company like IBM to actually put on a Jeopardy game and have Watson go and compete with them and do it in a kind of a studio. But to actually have Alex Trebek there, I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. But anyway, beside that, you've been there right from the beginning. You've seen this technology evolve. You know it better than almost anybody. Does it scare the pants off of you or does it excite you or is it a combination of both? Uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like all my answers have been a combination of both, which is an interesting point I make in this book, by the way, Willie, is about good power is how to manage tension, okay? Because you nor I get to live in the black and white world. And, and this is one of the things I used to always say to the media that I hated. I would say, look, I got it. You want to write in black and white. It's not the world I get to live in. I have to live. It's a gray world here of of everything. And so to this, this is another one of those questions like that. And I was just with a big healthcare group on Sunday night. Well, I won't say, but very, you would all know them world renowned. And so talking about AI, you're right. I was there in the beginning. And so what do, what are my most important lessons that are true then? And I told these guys it's true today. Look, I think AI will do some of the greatest in generative AI, which has brought it more to the masses. And just for the group listening, I'm going to really simplify what general AI is. When you think of it as chat GPT, um, it right. is, but what chat really does, and this will help you then put in perspective your question. It's really just predicting the next set of words. Oh, interesting. It's just predicting the next, it doesn't really understand it. It's predicting the next set of words. So that should tell you that if it's fueled with a lot of things that are not right, it's going to come out that way too, but very professional and look very, very like it's extremely well authorized what it is. And so knowing that that's what the technology does. On one hand, I can still see great opportunity like I did before, right? To get 
certain types of healthcare to people who never can, could get it before. You're going to be able to take mundane things people have to do to synthesize information, get it done really fast, et cetera. So all the positives you read, but the negatives will be bigger and faster that come with it. And so to me, this is what's different right now in this point in time. So I would say to people, what's different now, I am even more excited. You know, McKinsey will say it's a $16 trillion of productivity by 2030 is one of the studies most repeated, but this will not be about the technology. What we now face is going to be about people and trust in this technology, whether we ever see the good or we only see the bad side come out of it. Like we have an election coming up. Do you not think the countries that I could name are not funneling tons of bad information in there now because it learns from what's out in the big wild, okay, about what's going to happen with elections. And this will be our first test, by the way, of bad things happening. I think one of the big ones will be on the election scale. So I would say to you, so anybody out there, think of it when you think about these technologies, think about people and trust. On the people side, what I witness specifically when you want to now use this in a really professional arena is that if people don't understand the technology, they won't trust it and they won't use it. They'll fear it. In fact, Kissinger in his AI book says, things we don't understand, we revolt or fear. And as you know, it is not explainable too well right now. And why does it come up with the answers it comes up with to, to, the, to the normal person like you and I? So what I witnessed in healthcare a decade ago is still true. Why did doctors push it away? Because their first question was, well, why? Why did it come up with this? Or even if it was more right than a doctor, if it's not 100%, People are like, whoa, I can't trust this now. It's a very interesting behavioral difference. So what I, my view on to see good things, we should apply it in lots of what I would call low risk areas. In higher risk areas, when it comes to your health, the election, financial fraud, I think now we got to fix what we did last time and put things like liability responsibility on everyone who puts the stuff out there. We don't have that on the internet internet right now. We knew social media could have some downsides to it, but they kind of have a get out of free jail card on what how the laws are currently written. So going forward, we would do it different. So I think great things, but I think we can clearly go faster on the bad things as well, which, which is why I write all about, hey, look, good stewardship is just managing the positive and the negative at the same time. Don't just go work on the positives and forget these negatives. And don't just dwell on the negatives, which is why, I, to me, this is not about rhetoric and people saying, oh, stop that. You can't stop the technology. So now what can you do? As a company, everybody listening, people using it, focus on how to get people to trust it. Focus on how to train it with data you trust. You know, you can take these models and don't just use the big one everyone uses. You can take one, a large language model, and you can train it with your data. You can audit yourself. You can be sure it's free of bias. You can keep checking it. And- and in which case, it's going to do great things. It's going to make customer service people perform better. It's going to help HR, all these things. But I would do everything through the lens of trust and changing how people work. The other big thing I learned is if you just try to drop this stuff into how you currently run your business, I think it's going to be a mess. I watched it be a, a complete mess. People go, hey, I work hard already. You're going to just dump this on top of what I do? Instead, you got to rethink how they do their work, train them to do new things. I could go on forever on this. So the takeaway though is people in trust are what we should focus on. The technology is going to continue to evolve and it'll be very useful. But where we end with having people reimagine their work and then trust these outcomes will determine where we end with this technology. I think it's really interesting your comment there as it relates to sort of auditing the use of it. In, in the book, you talk about your efforts at IBM as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and equal pay. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting was just the way that you tasked your managers with going in and auditing their own group. I mean, it's like you can do things at a corporate level and at a company like IBM, which I can't even imagine what it's like to try and manage an organization that's that big and that complex. But to, when you get to a certain scale, there's sort of like, well, we're just going to do this on a corporate level, but you don't drop it down. And what was very evident in your talking about that was you said to you know managers and groups, go through and do an audit and look at all the women and look at all the men in your group. And if there is pay disparity, fix it. But this yeah. isn't like, you know, we're for promoting women. It's like, go down to the actual numbers in your PL on an annual basis. Look at what you pay women, look at what you pay men. And if they aren't getting equal pay, you need to make the adjustment. And I thought it was just, just a, like, people talk platitudes, but you actually brought it down to the action item that actually got you there at IBM. 
Yeah, that is that is just a general point that I learned from a lot of great people, meaning, you know, if you really have values and you believe them, you take action, you don't just talk. Your actions speak for your words more than your words do. Yeah. On cloud, Ginny, you talk extensively about the head start that Amazon and, and, and Microsoft had on IBM and getting into cloud. You got into cloud, you invested in cloud, and then you created what you deem the hybrid cloud uh, strategy. And you bought Red Hat, the largest acquisition that IBM had ever done. I think it was $36 billion you paid for Red Hat. Um, the hybrid cloud strategy, given that Amazon and Microsoft had one of the comments, I guess my question is this, that you say in why they had such a head start is because they had the consumer business. They had a consumer facing business versus you being more B2B. Explain for a moment why they got such a head start. Is it that Amazon had those, you know, Joe's surf shop that was... Yeah on Amazon and therefore Joe's Surf Shop wanted to use their cloud, whereas Marriott, a relationship that you talk about extensively in the book where Arnie Sorensen and Marriott had their big mainframe computers and their own computing, therefore they weren't looking to IBM for cloud services and that's what allowed I, uh, Amazon and, and, and Microsoft to jump yeah. ahead. I, I think that um, I'm going to try to do it in a way that I hope everyone will take away a thought on this is that the point I'm making is they, they'd started long before. So A, they had time on their side. So what does it mean to have had a consumer business? Um, we're in a world where you can start by building something really complex or start with the easy thing. By nature of what IBM does, it's mission critical work. It's always in this complex arena. These businesses started with the most simple. And I think you see this with lots of companies now. Where do they start? They start from the simple and they move up. It, it is easier to be simple and up than complex and come down. And so when what they had by when I say consumer is, you know, what did it do? Start with shopping, right? Things like that, that they made very consumable as a way because it's it's interfacing with millions of just individual users. So it's got to be easy to use, frictionless, fast, right? So they live in a world that puts a premium on simplicity and, and speed. And those are not, when you live in a complex world, you put a premium on security, being able to take care of every situation possible, but when you start down that path, you become complex to people, right? Because yes, you may be the most secure and you can handle every single case that could possibly happen. They're two different worlds. And I think there's something to be said now for what did I, we had to learn. We had to make ourselves consumable. We had to work, be able to work faster in addition to having the products, right? And so that to me, for anybody out there in, in your own business, boy, if you can't make things consumable and be able to move fast, that is what they, the kind of the characteristics that they really put a premium on in business everywhere and were able to do. So we had to teach ourselves those things, right? So how to render the, as you say, the complex simple in what we yeah. do, what we did to be able to compete. A cloud. For those that, I mean, I, again, I want to try to make it in a way that's useful um, in given the kind of business you're you're in and many of your, your clients here are in, um, yeah. you know, what we used to do is everybody got built their own individual um, homestead here and their own mansion and walls and everything. You move into a world where these are multifamily homes and buildings everywhere. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> okay. But when you're in the multifamily. <laughs> well done on the, the analogy. Plumbing, Perfectly right? done on the analogy, Jenny. That's great. I mean, you share the plumbing, you have the same elevator, you know, a bad yeah. guy can go from one floor to the next, you know, it's really quite, it's quite similar, you know, you get your two choices and what where we finally ended instead of trying to be the apartment condo guy instead of the residential single family dwelling we said to ourselves look the reality is all of our clients they'll never get to live in if they were born brand new they're going to build the condo building but they're not so they're going to end up to live in this you know this village made up of all of these things and that that's the world of a hybrid cloud to connect all those things together and be able to have families move from one place to another seamlessly you know and so that's an in the end, and I think we ended up being right. That is the world everyone's living in. Is that some things go in a cloud, some things stay on your in your building, some share between the two, some go there for a while, some because okay, China shut you down, you had to move it. I mean, so high. That's what a hybrid cloud is. Connects all those uh, single family dwellings and the condos together. <laughs> One of the hottest spaces in the in the. Uh, housing market is build for rent. So you can, you're living in a detached single family home, but you're actually renting it. So exactly what you're talking, you're exactly you go straight to where we are today, which is that BFR is a really hot space in the real estate industry. Um, yeah. 
a couple other things before we wrap this up. Uh, when you became CEO of IBM, you became the 19th female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Today, there are over 50. So in the last 12 years, we've made great progress as it relates to women in leadership positions of Fortune 500 companies. Um, do you think there's momentum that that keeps moving, Ginny, in the in the proper direction? It it, it it sort of stayed static for quite some time in that sort of low teens, and it seems like right now we've had a real surge. Do you do you think that has to do with something that is materially changed in the way that corporate ranks are being populated by women and women being given the opportunity, or do you think this might be just an anomaly now where we kind of spike up and then revert back to a to a lower number? Yeah, look. Even when you say the numbers you said, it's hardly a spike after all that no. period of time. It's okay. a teeny number, right? And yeah. so, yes, it's progress. So I, I'm a big fan of celebrating some progress. It's not perfection. Um, I do worry with just the sentiment out there today that anything to kind of take any underrepresented group and try to give them the same starting line is frowned upon or, or or looked at as being, you know, that's not fair to do. And and that is my bigger worry, right? Because, um, and whether that's women or whether that is Blacks in different positions or Hispanics or other underrepresented groups, I feel the same about the answer overall. And in Willie, if I can, in our last minute, it's, it's why this big arc, again, the book says, talks a lot about, you know, the power you have as an individual when you transition to running and caring about other people. But then realize you do have the power to make sort of institutional change on a broad basis. You may not feel it, but you do. And to me, one of the biggest things right now in the world is that more people need a better opportunity. And it's a little bit, whether it's women to be CEOs or just generally speaking in the population, I think one of the biggest sort of things I fear for democracy is not enough people feel they have a better future, whether it's women or other groups. And and this is why I do a lot of work right now, if I can end on, if you let me end on this point, um, that the work I do today is from something I learned through all my 40 years and back to my mom about access and and access and aptitude are not equal, meaning a lot of, lot of smart people out there, but they may not all have access to these great things. And if you don't think you have a better future or your kids aren't going to have a better job, then you start to say, hey, let's vote on something else or let's let's have a riot. Let's storm this. Let's do that. You look for a different system. And so the answer to that question and others to me lies in the work all of us can do is to give more people good opportunities right now. And uh, how I've manifested that is something I had learned about hiring people for skills, not just their degrees. And if you do that, you will end up working with many underrepresented groups because a fact I learned, which I had no idea until I stumbled into it, 65% of Americans do not have a college degree. 80% of Black Americans do not have a college degree. And I could quote the same numbers in every developed country in the world. And yet all of our companies, your maybe your company, I don't know, mine, 100% of our good jobs required a college degree. But to make, I, I, I won't, we don't have the time. My experience taught me that wasn't true, that to get started, I'll bet 50% of my jobs. And that's what it turned out. We went through a decade long piece of work, recredentializing jobs and getting people to understand that this wasn't lowering the bar. This was just recognizing people at different starting points. When we started hiring people with just an associate degree from a high school and a community college in an underrepresented area, they turned out to be as productive same results. They were more loyal, more retentive. 75% did go on to get degrees, just didn't have the money to do it to start. And I got a more inclusive workforce out of it. So if if anything I could also leave people with, back to your question, yes, women, but all underrepresented groups, is this idea that one of the biggest structural barriers is that we all require college degrees for our good jobs. And I bet if you rewrote the job based on a skill, not just a degree, you would be surprised how many people qualify to get started. And um, so that's what I do now. I uh, It's called Skills First is a movement. Uh, some friends and I have created a group called 110, a million black employees without four-year degrees into middle, middle class jobs, upwardly mobile, uh, whether it's Delta and Ed Bastion taking off the requirement for pilots to have a four-year degree, get a thousand applicants the next day. They get it through other ways, you know, training in other ways. Uh, Cleveland Clinic in, in Cleveland, 
almost all jobs other than a doctor now don't require a college degree to start. And it is, and we need caregivers, you know, it's amazing to see the people in this country that have skill if given a chance. And then it changes your whole culture for everybody to be around promoting them and advancing them on skills, not just these false sort of sometimes false indicators. And before I'll end, I'll say, really, I am, I'm not against college. I'm vice chair at a university. It is again, people, oh, you're, you're, you're think college isn't worth it. No, no. Well, the money on some colleges are not worth it. Okay. And, but with the world of AI we're working, moving into you and me and everybody are going to have to have retraining ourselves every three years. So we better kind of get used to this idea of a skills first world. Cause to me, it'll be one of the greatest implications of AI is that it is education will no longer be once and done. Sorry, so my, I had to no, get that no, it's in. Great. It's great. My final question to you um, is this, you've spoken in front of huge audiences You've yeah. been on national television more times than you could possibly remember. What makes you most nervous? Presenting in front of a group of several thousand people, going on live national television, or teeing off at the first green at Augusta National? Golfing, for sure. <laughs> Those <laughs> others who can improve I preparation. Condoleezza I asked Condoleezza the exact same question because she's had the exact same types of experiences. And she said, no doubt teeing off at the first to the custom. Isn't, isn't that the truth? The, the other two, preparation can make you better. Yeah. The third, preparation she, has not made me better, no, hard, no matter how hard I've tried. <laughs> she said she the first time she ever teed off, it was the most nerve wracking moment she's ever had. And she literally said, I don't even remember whether the ball, where the ball landed. And what I do know is it got in the air and I was very thankful that it did. So anyway, yeah, uh, no doubt about that. No doubt. It's great. Well, well thank I, you. I thank you so much for your time. And your book is absolutely fantastic. And um, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to have you on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for doing this. And I hope your listeners got something of value for the hour they gave us. I'm sure they did. Thanks again, Jenny. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.